Astias tu oma wiki namas tu namu sida. The islands that make up the mountainous archipelago of Indonesia were created through a still frighteningly active volcanic line which runs from Sumatra to New Guinea. Bali was formed by the activity of three great volcanoes which run from east to west across the island forming a north-south watershed. In the distant past this small island was connected to Java. Even today, the three kilometre strait between the two islands is no more than 60 metres deep. To the east of Bali is the Lombok Strait of fathomless depth. Bali is the physical end of what was once mainland Asia. According to Balinese belief, the island of Bali rests on the back of the cosmic turtle, entwined by two giant serpents. The gods dwell on the high slopes of the mountain beyond human knowledge. The craters of the volcanoes that created the island have now become life-supporting lakes. Bali is one of the smallest islands of the Indonesian archipelago with a population approaching three million the majority of whom are rice farmers. Human density varies from 200 to 700 inhabitants per square kilometre. Before man began to farm the land, the island was covered in rainforest, which flourished in the rich volcanic soil. The present population are believed to have migrated from mainland Asia about 5,000 years ago, bringing with them the knowledge of wet rice cultivation and using a language akin to those of Malay Polynesian peoples. Now, as in the past, the religion and culture of the Balinese people is dominated by ancestor worship. Daily life is directed by the souls of departed ancestors who dwell on the mountain peaks and at the hidden sources of the rivers without whose waters no rice could grow. The ancestors were the founders of the village communities. They established the customs and continue to nurture their growth. The advice and requests of these ancestors to their descendants are communicated through priests in trance. Mountains are acknowledged as sources of supernatural power. People have always made pilgrimages to sites high on the slopes of a mountain to be closer to their gods and deified ancestors. Mountains are regarded as a manifestation of divine energies. The creator, providing water, the source of life. The destroyer, the cauldron of fire, the wrath of the gods. Just as their ancestors have been doing since ancient times, hundreds of worshippers make a pilgrimage to this mountain sanctuary. Holy water is a dominant element of Balinese religion and healing rites. The water is obtained from a pure spring and then ritually activated by priests. Such water has reviving powers and acts as a purifier bestowing release from impediment or contamination. After making the appropriate homage, 
the community reconfirms its devotion before the assembled deities. It is this continuity of traditions which makes Bali an island of abiding fascination for travelers and scholars. <laughs> On the slopes of Gunung Agung, the highest mountain on the island, is the major state temple of the island, Pura Besake. For how long this site has been used for worship is unknown. Over the ages, the temple has retained its significance and the shrines have been consistently maintained. Buildings in the tropical environment of Bali require continual maintenance and care. In the center of the temple is a black stone shrine of the Tri Sakti, the symbol of the three gods of the Hindu trinity. Siva in the center is yellow, Vishnu is black and Brahma red. They sit in constant attendance over mankind's needs and dilemmas. Generally, gods only visit temples when invited to do so during rituals. As it is the most important temple on the island, the gates of Pura Bisake are always open. From earliest times, sacred music and dance have been an integral part of worship. Priest guardians receive the warriors who bring an offering in the form of dance. Because people have honored sites of power by continually rebuilding and adapting, few megalithic monuments remain untouched. Such temple terraces are found on mountain slopes throughout Indonesia and Polynesia. They are among mankind's earliest places of worship. The block of stone is a megalithic altar. The potency of this ancient place of worship remains. Stone burial caskets of wealthy village heads which contained beads, bracelets, coins, and weapons for use in the afterworld are believed to date from an era well before the birth of Christ. The way of life of the people of Trunyang a village pressed against the crater face on the shore of Lake Batua provides evidence of how the original inhabitants of Bali lived. Unlike the more modern immigrants of the Indianized northern and southern slopes, these Bali Agar people do not cremate their dead or even bury them. Corpses are left in open graves protected by bamboo cages. The elephant cave in central Bali is one of the earliest examples of the intermingling of earlier beliefs and those of greater India. The carved relief around the cave entrance represents spirits of nature. The large face is Boma, born of a union between the high god, Vishnu, and the earth goddess. Although Boma is now found on all temple gateways, this is its earliest representation on the island. Inside the cave, we find other examples of early Indic influences. The lingam was a common object of devotion in earlier times. Denoting male creative energy, 
It is one of the first abstract visualizations of the divine. When the lingam is combined with the primary symbol of female creative energy, the yoni, the vulva, they represent the union that procreates and sustains the life of the universe. It symbolizes the antagonistic yet cooperating forces of the sexes. On the southern slopes of the central mountains, members of far-flung village wards gather at their temple of origin with their protective cult deities, the dragon-like Barong. The mountain landscape reverberates with their festive passing. In the covered baskets are masks of Barong's counterpart, the horrifying Rangda, the female witch, a representation of Durga, the goddess of death who in the heart of all Balinese is the harbourer of evil and the creator of disaster and yet, if appeased, also the container of it. The baskets remain closed on this occasion. The power of Rangda is not activated. This pilgrimage with Barong might have originated as a means of showing tribute and allegiance to some political and spiritual power source. Each village is proud of its Barong. Its appearance and vitality personify the spirit of each village. Ratu Gede, as Barong is generally referred to in Bali, acts as a protector of the village. past, barong resembling such animals as the tiger, elephant and wild boar were common. In present day Bali, most have the form of a mythological lion called keke. Barong is a wonderful example of the sacred. Masks are carved from the wood of trees said to be magically powerful. Barong is an enduring symbol of what remains an imprint of contact between the great kingdoms of China and Bali in ancient times. What is obvious is the parallel of the dragon's function in both Bali and Old China. The lion-like mask, the body animated by two players, the function of performance as an exorcism for the protection of the village, the giving of food and coins to him as he goes from house to house at the Galongan festival in return for his protection, are all common elements found in both traditional China and present-day Bali. Whatever his origin, the barong is an object of devotion a source of protection and a link with past ancestral power. The foundations of Bali's present-day Indianized culture began in Java. These temples, built around 730 AD and located in central Java, are among the earliest examples of Hindu architecture found in Indonesia. Poet historians have recorded many of the legends and myths of ancient times. One such story concerns the magically powerful king, Sri Aji Maya Danawa, who ruled in Bali during legendary times. When the gods refused to comply with his requests, Maya Danawa not only ceased to adhere to ancestral traditions and to maintain the temples, but he forbade his subjects to worship and to make offerings. He believed himself to be as great as any god. In an age long, long ago, a king of Bali and his chief minister, the demonic Kalawong, destroyed the offerings to the gods made by mankind. It was an evil time. Plague and famine ravaged the beautiful island of Bali. In deep distress, mankind prayed to the gods at a sacred shrine that they might be released from this misery. The great god Indra 
the warlike god of heaven, descended to seek and destroy the destructive king. <laughs> Defeated in battle, Mayo Danawa and Kalawong fled the wrath of Indra. By using his magical powers of self-transformation, Maya Danawa disappeared and reappeared at will, teasing and tempting the great lord of heaven. The chase continued. Maya Danawa fled through the heartland of the island before the force of Indra's unwavering concentration. At what is now the village of Tampak Siring, Mayo Danawa walked on the side of his feet to confuse his pursuers. Tampak foot, Siring sigh. Cornered and fearing defeat, in desperation, Maya Danawa poisoned the water supply, killing all who drank of it. Only Indra remained alive. Through his bow and arrow, the great god created the life-restoring spring of Tirta Mpul. a site still sacred today. <laughs> Finally, Batara Indra slayed the demonic king, turning him into a rock. The legend may symbolize the triumph of Indianized religions on Bali. Mythology claims that for seven generations following the death of Maya Danawa, Bali was ruled by a dynasty of male and female twins. From that time, the birth of twins of opposite sex to ordinary village folk invoked severe taboos. Archaeological remains from around the 8th century AD indicate that Buddhism was an important force at the court of the kings who ruled in the Pejeng Badulu area of central Bali. One of the greatest extant works of art that the island possesses was carved at Ye Pulu, apparently by a single hermit. The 20 meter long relief provides a record of everyday life in those ancient times. There is no indication that Hinduism or Buddhism arrived in Indonesia through conquest. It appears that these religions were spread peacefully by traders, wandering monks from India, and perhaps Indonesians who traded with India. In Buddhist mythology, Hariti was a demoness reputed to be a voracious devourer of children. Eventually, she was converted by the Buddha himself, and now enjoys the status of a protectress of the children she once harmed. Hariti and her spouse have been adopted into Balinese folklore under the name of Men and Pan Brayut. In this folktale, they play the role of poor parents caring for their many children. <laughs> From the 9th to the 14th century, the prime sources of Balinese history are royal edicts inscribed on bronze plates and occasionally on stone. The earliest king identified by these inscriptions is Kesari Wamadewa, who ruled around 913 AD. This inscribed stone pillar is the earliest evidence of writing on the island. It describes the exploits of King Kesari in defeating his enemies in battle. The language used in the inscription suggests that the kingdom was most probably Buddhist. Bronze plate inscriptions from later kings state the rights of various villages to autonomy within the kingdom. One inscription provides evidence that by 1073 AD, Balinese society had become so Indianized that it had adopted a type of caste system. Eralanga, the son of Udayana, a famous Balinese king, married into the royal court of Eastern Java. For a short period, there was close cultural contact between Java and Bali. Chandi reliefs cut into the side of the river gorge are memorials to the kings of this period.
Some villages, such as Tanganan in eastern Bali, have maintained the architecture and traditions of this period. Tanganan lays claim to its land through a grant from one of the kings of the 11th century. The people of this village claim descent from the god Indra. If an inhabitant marries someone who is not from the original descent line of the village, they are compelled to live outside the village. Because of this pride in their origin, many old skills and traditions survive. is now a kind of ritualized sporting event. It may have started as a training exercise for war. The rules, in many ways, are similar to those of 20th century boxing, complete with rounds and judges. Over time, the Malay Chris became the sacred weapon of higher caste Balinese. A man's identification with his Chris became so complete that it could be used as a substitute for its owner at his wedding. A great deal of the folklore of Java and Bali dwells on the mystical power of the Chris. The fall of great dynasties and kingdoms was often attributed to its misuse. Under the generalship of Gajah Mada, the great Hindu-Javanese kingdom of Majapahit conquered Bali in 1343. The Majapahit Empire dominated the entire archipelago. It was a period of a great flowering of the arts in Java and Bali. It was generally those of priestly status and court officials who were able to read and compile Lontar leaf manuscripts. Beautiful epic poems were written and theater, music and architecture reached great heights of refinement as the courts of the lesser princes competed with the power and prestige of the central court. Through oral tradition and the dramatic arts, the history of Bali has passed on to succeeding generations. Topeng is masked dance theatre which tells of the lives, triumphs and trials of past kings. The performance always follows a set pattern of theatrical rules. First appears the Prime Minister of the Kingdom, the epitome of knightly Kasatriya ideals. He is followed by the King Hero, who, in Balinese theatrical rhetoric, is named Dalong. He always wears the serene white mask of refinement and wisdom. It is an idealized portrait representing kings as a class. His extended dance routine demonstrates the required qualities of kingship. Dignity, grace, beauty, refinement, and wisdom. The kings and ministers speak in the literary language of Majapahit called Kawi, which has a high content of Sanskrit terms. <laughs> The story begins when the servant clowns appear. <laughs> they use everyday Balinese language, translating the story to the audience. For the villagers in the audience, it is as much a social occasion as a theatrical experience. Here is an opportunity to exchange gossip and develop romantic relationships.
After four or more hours, the performance comes to a swift and dramatic climax where, as anticipated, right defeats wrong and all is well with the world. By the 14th century, Islam had become the major force throughout the Indonesian archipelago. The spread of Islam toppled Hindu-Buddhist Majapahit, and tradition has it that this caused priests, princes, artists and artisans who wished to maintain their old beliefs to flee eastwards to Bali. From the 14th century to 1906, there was little cultural interchange between Islamic Java and Hindu-Buddhist Bali. Bali itself was generally undisturbed by the coming of Islam. For those living in villages, the timeless chores of village life continued much as they did till the 20th century. Since Indianization, Bali has maintained a caste system, but one much less rigid than that practiced in India. An honored class called Pande are blacksmiths. In earlier times, their skills, particularly in making kris, gave them special status. Until the present day, they've maintained this distinction. This village is exclusively made up of Pande though now their mystical tasks are reduced. Today they use their skills to produce musical instruments, agricultural tools, kitchen utensils and knives for the cockfight. Each family has its own forge. Bali lies in close proximity to the equator. Its volcanic mountain ridge provides a heavy rainfall as the numerous peaks break the path of the rain-bearing monsoon winds. From the lake reservoirs high in the volcanic craters, water seeps down to form springs and rivers which provide constant irrigation for the wet rice even throughout the long dry season. Without the water from the mountain lakes, the rice would not grow. And rice has always provided the wealth for the quality of life achieved by the people of Bali. The Ulun Danu Temple, by the edge of Lake Batur, is sacred to the island's farming communities. In its walls dwells the goddess of the lake, Dewi Danu, who benevolently passes the water down the steep slopes to the rice fields. The Baris Gede, an ancient ritual warrior dance, reaffirms mankind's relationship to the source from which the water comes. Each year, Subak groups, the irrigation cooperatives which administer the equitable distribution of water, make pilgrimages to this temple and ask for blessings for next season's crops. Holy water, a gift of the lake goddess, is given to each group by the priest of the temple to be poured into the irrigation canals to ensure a constant water supply.
The religiously auspicious day for planting the rice is determined on the basis of a specific conjunction of weeks and days from the 210-day calendar. The seedlings are gathered from the seed beds. Beginning in the northeast, the corner closest to the rising sun and the great mountain, the farmers plant the seedlings eight at a time, a hand span apart. They place the eighth seedling in the ground before returning to plant the sixth and seventh ones. Once a month, the farmers attend a meeting of the Subak, the agricultural association that looks after all matters concerning the rice field. Important decisions are reached by majority vote. This is followed by an informal social gathering. These farmers relax by drinking palm toddy, singing and making music. This particular activity is peculiar to East Bali and the Balinese section of the neighboring island of Lombok. A farmer's day begins shortly after dawn. He generally works his field from 5.30 to 11, then returns home for lunch, avoiding the heat of the midday sun. He is out in the fields again at 2, and returns to bathe before dusk. The Balinese believe that dusk and sunset are mystically dangerous times of day. When the rice shows the first signs of coming into ear, or becoming pregnant, as the Balinese describe it, a special rite takes place. While it is the men who work the fields, it is the women of the family who perform rituals and harvest the rice. Between members of the household and their rice fields, a strong connection is maintained. A burning torch lit from the kitchen hearth is brought to light the incense. On the way to the fields, they stop at the Subak temple, where they invoke the help of Dewi Sri, the goddess of rice, in securing the health of the crop. When the rice is at this stage of growth, it can often be spoiled by disease or birds. The sequence of rituals to ensure the growth of traditional rice is often likened by the Balinese to those performed in the human life cycle. To acknowledge this moment in the life of the rice plant, there were two distinct offerings. One is a symbol representing Dewi Sri, the goddess of rice. The other, called U Bugabig, is a representation of an hermaphrodite. In the history of pre-mechanized agriculture, few societies have ever reached the high levels of productivity achieved by the wet rice farmers of Bali. With traditional technology, the peasant farmer of Bali could produce twice as much rice on his land as his neighbour, the Javanese farmer. Four factors contributed to this success. The fertility of the volcanic soil, the Balinese farmer's understanding of environmental matters, particularly irrigation and soil nutrition, the cooperative manpower organisational systems of the Subak, and the development over thousands of years of highly productive disease-resistant strains of rice. 
While the rice is ripening, it needs to be protected from the birds who can easily devour much of the crop. Intricate systems of scaring paraphernalia are used. Nowadays, the ubiquitous plastic bag is found to be the most effective means of keeping the birds from the ripening rice. Padi Baru, the fast-growing new hybrid rice of the Green Revolution, is ready to harvest approximately 100 days after planting, in contrast to the traditional rice which takes 210 days to ripen. The new rice is cut and threshed off the stalks in the fields. The new rice has, in some cases, increased the volume of the year's crop, but in taste it doesn't compare to the traditional longer growing rice, for which barley is famous throughout the Indonesian archipelago. After threshing, the stalks of the new rice are piled and burnt to provide an easy, if not highly effective, fertilizer, so that a new crop can quickly be planted. The new miracle rice has brought its share of problems. For this rice to be successful, large amounts of chemical fertilizers and pesticides are necessary. This has tied the formerly independent farmer to the international petrochemical complex. The overcropping has worn out productive fields which have, for over a thousand years, provided excellent crops of traditional rice. The pesticides have poisoned frogs, eels and birds the natural predators of the vermin which can destroy the crops. Intricate rites surround the harvesting of the traditional tall willowing rice. Special knives, hidden in the hands of the women, cut the ears of rice from their stalks so as not to scare the goddess of the rice, Dewi Sri. Children following behind gather their own harvest. Traditional rice is carried home as ears on the stalk where it is dried by the tropical sun and stored in a rice barn in the house compound. The harvest is then threshed from the stalks. The tune that the women beat out gives thanks to the gods for their kindness. Finally, the rice is husked before being cooked or sold in the market. Besides being the staple food of the Balinese, rice has a sacred function in that it is a major ingredient of all types of temple offerings. Market day begins early for the women of the island. To get to the market on time, they have to leave home before daybreak. Markets are held every third day at major centres throughout the island. Market associations, organised in groups of three districts, work together, holding markets in rotation. A market is noisy with the sounds of people bargaining as a great variety of goods and produce exchange hands. Apart from the change in clothing habits, markets today function much as they have done for centuries, acting as the hub of each district's financial activities. Women are the financiers who control the market, for the men are traditionally engaged in working the fields. Through their activities in the market, women control the domestic economies of most Balinese households. The goods bought at market are nowadays rapidly transferred around the island. 
The largest market in Bali is located in the city of Denpasar, which is the provincial capital, with a population of around 200,000 people. The first European to visit Bali, it appears, was Sir Francis Drake in 1580. The first written description of the island was by the Dutchman Cornelius de Houtman, who visited the island 17 years later. He described Bali as a very fruitful island of rice, hens and hogs. The inhabitants are heathens and have no religion, for some pray to king, other to son, and every man as he thinketh good. When a man dieth, his wife burneth herself with him. The visitors noted the fabulous wealth of the court of Gelgel. They described the Dewa Agung in procession, driving himself in a carriage drawn by two white oxen. Two of de Hartmann's crew jumped ship, preferring the enchantments of Bali to further shipboard travels. Western contact with Bali remained rare until 1836, when the Danish entrepreneur Mars Langer set up a trading station at what is now the popular tourist centre of Kuta. Fearful that other European powers were interested in Bali, the Dutch decided it was time they brought the proud Balinese under the control of their East Indies empire. As a justification for their actions, the Dutch authorities in Batavia laid their claims for annexation on contracts signed with the Rajas of Bali many years earlier. In the first two expeditions to North Bali in 1846 and 1848, the Dutch were repelled at Jagaraga by the fierce Balinese warriors, led by the charismatic and brilliant general Jelantik. Eventually, with an overwhelming force, the Dutch defeated North Bali in 1849. Further insurrections followed, and it was not until 1868 that resistance in North Bali was completely subdued. South Bali maintained its freedom at this time, but petty wars between the kingdoms created instability. Opium consumption, rife amongst the rulers, interfered with their judgment. The Dutch used the excuse of the looting of shipwrecks and the continuing practice of Masatia, in which widows threw themselves into the flames of their husband's funeral pyres, to attack southern Bali in 1906 with all the weaponry of a 20th century army. The Balinese had no weapons to match. Rather than face the ignominy of defeat, capture or banishment, the kings, their families, including all the women, children and retainers of first Kesiman and then Permachutan of Denpasar, dressed in white, marched into the Dutch guns. Others turned their chris upon themselves. All but one young Balinese prince were killed in this ritual fight to the death. Other kings and leaders of the island committed private suicide rather than endure exile. Two years later, the same horrifying events were repeated at the palace of Klung Kung, when the Dewa Agung, the lineal descendant of Majapahit, and the spiritual king of all Bali also committed Puputan. The rulers of Bali preferred death in freedom to life in subjection. The new Dutch administration, perhaps mortified by these events, ruled the island in a fair-handed manner. In 1935, Governor General de Jong made an official visit to Bali. At about this time, Bali began to enter the imagination of the world. A Dutch shipping company set up a regular tourist connection with the island. Two feature films were made on location, and numerous pictorials heralded the wonders of the most exotic island in the world. Such notables as Charlie Chaplin, Noel Coward, Aldous Huxley, Betty Hutton, and Lady Diana Cooper visited the island during the 1930s. In 1942, Bali, like the rest of Southeast Asia, fell before the onslaught of the conquering Japanese expansionist drive. 
It was a difficult time for the Balinese, as all rice and other foodstuffs were commandeered to support the Japanese war effort. By the war's end, the people of Bali were facing severe deprivations and the very immediate prospect of famine and epidemic. When Japan capitulated after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the nationalist leaders Sukarno and Hatta declared Indonesia an independent nation on the 17th of August, 1945. Almost immediately, Balinese officials took over the civil government of Bali. In March 1946, however, the Dutch returned to set up an administration as had existed in pre-war days. A small paramilitary group under the charismatic leadership of Gusti Nura Rai fought the returning Dutch colonialists to the very end. After a year of guerrilla war in the mountains and hills of Bali, Nura Rai and his now depleted band of 95 followers were surrounded by a numerically superior force at Marga. Another Puputan followed, as the entire command crying, freedom or death, Merdeka Atumati, were wiped out by bombs and cannon fire. Finally, in 1949, after fierce battles fought mainly in neighboring Java, Holland accepted the inevitable, and Indonesia gained independence. Under the leadership of Sukarno, its founding president, the Republic of Indonesia underwent the growing pains associated with the transition from colony to nationhood. In the second decade of Sukarno's presidency, Problems began to emerge for the new nation as it got caught in the quagmire of world political pressures. The spectre of communism was perceived as an additional threat to the stability of the nation. In Bali, during the early 60s, there were signs that the divine powers were seriously displeased. In 1962, a rat plague destroyed most of the rice crop and the rice stored in granaries. In 1963, when preparations were underway to celebrate the once every 100 year rite at Purapasake, Gunung Agung erupted for the first time in modern history, wiping out entire villages. Thousands died during the eruption and the ensuing famine and epidemics. In 1965, communist agitators unsuccessfully attempted to take over the government of the fledgling republic. In the chaos that followed, there were reprisals against communist sympathizers. Bali was the scene of some of the worst violence, where thousands were killed as members of the island's political parties turned against each other. Near where these herons now roost in central Bali was a major burial ground. They only began to roost here after the deaths. In local law, it is said that the herons are the reincarnations of these victims. Under the stability provided by the rule of President Suharto, Bali has prospered. Bali is now a major international tourist destination. Here, tourists enjoy the frightening tale about the witch who brought plague and disaster to Bali at the time when Udayana was king in the 11th century. This performance takes place every morning of the year. The Balinese passion for the theatre assures that high standards are maintained. Because of the context of these performances, the stabbing in the Chris dance is often simulated. Actual trance is generally reserved for religious occasions. Tourism has now become a major source of additional income. A demand for wood carving, silver and gold jewellery, fabrics, basketware and painting has created a new marketplace for the exchange of money and ideas. Usually, a single village specialises in a particular tourist product. Mas is the centre of a refined wood carving cottage industry which began in its highly successful modern form during the 1930s. 
Bona, also in the Gyanya district of central Bali, is the center for basket weaving. The villages grouped around the small township of Ubud are centers for the tourist painting industry. Painting in particular was greatly influenced by an influx of Western artists who came to live in Ubud during the 1930s. Inspired by Bali, they in turn inspired a renaissance in Balinese art. Meticulous concern for detail is a cultural trait of the Balinese. Since the fall in the price of oil, tourism has now become a major priority for the Jakarta government as a means of attracting foreign exchange. Bali is the jewel in the crown of tourism in Indonesia. In 1969, the first year after the international airport was opened, 20,000 foreign tourists came to the Island of the Gods. It is planned that by the year 1990, 700,000 tourists a year will visit. With Indonesian domestic tourism also on the rise, the number of tourists could well reach one million. The impact of tourism has, to some extent, been kept at bay. So that the fragile environment of the island could be protected, the government has sensibly restricted the hotels and other major tourist facilities to the southern peninsula, close to the capital city of Denpasar. The streets of the Kuta Beach district are now lined with small shops to cater for the increasing tourist trade. The infrastructure for a major complex of hotels was financed by the World Bank. New hotels have recently been built at Nusa Dua. This hotel, partly owned by Garuda Airlines, is one of the leading hotels on the island. Balinese dance groups are brought to the hotels to entertain guests. Because of its great mystique, Bali is now probably one of the most photographed places on earth. Changes have occurred on Bali in the last 80 years since the island was brutally forced to join the modern world. The change from a barter to a money economy, the development of the island as a major tourist destination, the island's absorption into the modern state of Indonesia, a threat to traditional ways of life by technological advancements, and finally, the increasing population of the island has brought pressure on the ratio between land and people, forcing many to find alternative employment to rice farming. Although fearful of the sea, the Balinese have also been quick to utilize its assets. Salt has always been an important article of trade in Bali. Under the heat of the tropical sun, the black volcanic beaches, which cause rapid evaporation of the water, have provided a tough subsistence for some. With the boom in tourism, there has been a greater demand for the seafoods that abound in the tropical waters that surround Bali. The Balinese do not generally choose to live close to the sea, nor on the top of mountains. Such space is not considered to be man's appropriate environment. Just as mountains are occupied by deities, so is the sea the abode of other powerful forces. A place to be avoided, a place which harbors demonic agents of disease and destruction. Consequently, the sea is treated with great respect. At the time of the Galungan festival, Balinese fishermen rededicate their boats so that no harm will befall them from the dangerous sea. This ritual has similarities to the birthday rite of passage held every 210 days for all Balinese people.
The sea is best regarded as a duality, a source of powerful demonic forces and a place of purification and exorcism. Its vast wastes act as a nullifier. It has the power to absorb all kinds of pollution and yet itself remain pure. At the sea, mankind can, through appropriate rituals, maintain the balance between the forever combatant forces of good and evil. Many important temples of Bali are situated beside the sea and propose to deal with the powerful forces that the sea represents. The ashes of the cremated dead are consigned to the sea, or rivers that run into the sea, for final purification. For centuries, the people of Bali have been adopting, adapting, or resisting influences from other cultures. They have accepted small details of custom and technology, but have, until now, shown a great ability to resist drastic changes. Throughout an eventful history, the people of Bali have remained uniquely true to the Balinese philosophy of life.